Okay, recording. So this is the course web page, and um, so you'll need to make a note of this and go there. You can shorten it up if you like. You can go to here, and then it redirects you to uh, to this wiki. And then I have I'm teaching two classes this quarter. Uh, 201 and 405. So you just click on that 201 and here is the schedule of activities. Everything you need to do in this class is already described in the web in the website. So you're going to want to go here and study this material. You'll see here's the syllabus. I know actually people are just walking in. You're not late. <laughs> Don't feel late. I'm just early. Actually, I'm normally late, so. But not this quarter, because I made a New Year's resolution, and I will always be on time. Okay. <laughs> so here it is, uh, Computer Science 201. And there is a textbook. I'm looking around to see if anyone has the book. Does anyone have the book? We got it. Okay, but you didn't bring it, right? Oh, you got it here? Okay. Is anyone confused about what to buy? It's straightforward, right? You go to the bookstore. There it is. Hold that up. That's the book. And did you get that at the bookstore? You, like Amazon or something? Where? EBay. Oh, eBay. Yeah, right. So let's take a look here. You know, I've been describing a little bit about what's going to happen this quarter before everyone arrived. I want to re re restate that uh, I'm going to try for the first time capturing my, my lecture on, um, on video. But it's a video of my desktop not and a video of my voice, not the video of my face. And so I'm going to try that. And it's uh, for people who want to stay at home, you know, and, and listen to videos, or if you want to go through the lecture material, some of it, you probably won't want to listen to like what I'm saying right now. But, um, so I'm going to experiment with that. And I'm also very interested in, in online learning and web-based courses. So, you know, I'm looking at trying to perhaps convert this class or offer it in some kind of an online, fully online format. So I'm experimenting with creating videos for that purpose. So here's the syllabus. Here's my name. These are my office hours. And uh, the thing about office hours and getting assistance, uh, Chan Ho is the teaching assistant for this class. Once again, Chan, can you stand and be visible for the people that arrived on time? There we go. So he's also available. Now you'll notice that one way to get help is to use this uh, Wimba Pronto. And I'm going to sign into that. I've never used this before. And you can see that Chan is the one and only other member of the course. So if you want to communicate uh, with us and with each other using this tool, you'll need to log into Blackboard and and go to I'll show you where to get that from actually. Is there anybody with their laptops on? Go right ahead, log into Blackboard, install Wimba Pronto and then uh, and we'll chat together just so everyone see how it works. Of course you're all familiar with online chat and all that, but just to, just to get the ball rolling here, let's go ahead and do that. And so, um, let me do this. I will go to, this is the syllabus. <coughs> There's two lab sessions, and we'll see how that goes. So what I've noticed in the past when I've taught 202, which is the course that follows this one, is that some students like to come to both lab sessions and some students don't like to come to either. 
So that way we can, I can fit everybody in there. Right? So if everybody shows up to one lab session, well, there's going to be a problem. But uh, I haven't seen that happen yet. Uh, so I would say at this point that you're welcome to come to either lab session depending on your schedule. And uh, the course format, we're going to read and do problems from the first seven chapters of the book. And you need to, let's see how this works. So there's weekly lab sessions. You need to do problems in those lab sessions. And also every week I'll assign uh, programming problems. And you need to complete these programming problems. If you want to do them in lab, you can, but uh, they're, they're designed to be com completed outside of lab. And then <coughs> you need to log into Blackboard and uh, submit your lab reports and lab and, uh, and assignment reports through Blackboard. So it's great to collaborate. You know, I encourage students to collaborate, but it doesn't mean you can, you know, what you don't want to cross the line and just copy someone's work and submit that, right? Because then you're not going to learn anything. And of course, the problem with that is you might get a grade from me unless I can see that you don't understand the work you're submitting. But when you go to sit for the exam, the exams will very um, closely match the assignments that you're working on. So you won't be able to pass the exam unless you've done those uh, assignments on your own. Or it, with, with, the, with the help of of others, that's fine. So collaboration, I think, is fantastic. Actually, in the in the world of software development, there's a lot of collaborative work. It's very much collaboration-based. People work. There's even a style of programming called pair programming, where two people work together. One person is at the keyboard, and the other person is just sitting there, looking, reading the screen, and making comments. Or the other person perhaps has got a browser or, you know, the manual, which is online. And uh, so they, people work together in that scenario, team program. Because a lot of work is also done individually as well. But uh, most of it is, uh, is collaborative. At some point, you have to work with other people to get things done. Uh, now, this here's something that... Uh, that may maybe news uh, maybe maybe new to you. I'm sure it's new to you. It's a, called a revision control system, and that is the that's a, a revision control system. That's what we're going to use in this class to submit work. And a revision control system lets is a, it's a system that lets software developers or developers of other collaborative projects that have files as the as the outcome of the projects. It allows these people working together to, sh to, to work on the same objects. So these objects, these files are stored in a central server and the people that are working on the team check out copies of what's in the central server, modify those and then commit changes into the repository. They call it the repository. The repository is the storage a container that contains all of the files of, your, of a given project. So we're going to use that tool. We're going to use uh, one of these tools. Uh, in particular, we're going to use Subversion. That's a, that is a, a version control system that we're going to use in this class. Uh, so that's going to be a little tricky in the beginning to, to learn how to use that, but that's what uh, you know, we're going to help you in in particular during lab session, also perhaps during chat through this Wimba Pronto system and so on. Um, we will help you figure out and learn how to use this subversion system to commit your work into a repository. Here are the course goals. Learn how to write programs in the C++ language. Improve computational thinking skills. So how to, what is a computational thinking skill? Well, it's the, that includes the skills that you use to solve computational problems. Problems that need a computer 
uh, for their solution. And need a computer in a way which looks more like programming the computer, how to define a sequence of operations and perhaps constructs that break a sequence like decisions and branching and looping and recursion, you know, routines, calling themselves, all that kind of stuff. That's that falls in the area of computational thinking and more and more uh, jobs of, of varying fields like biology and chemistry and accounting and so on, more and more there's a, there's a, there's a need to develop computational thinking skills to solve problems in many, well practically every discipline, every field. Every field is touched by computers and so computer science skills, computational thinking skills are relevant pretty much in anything that you are going to do. You may not have those skills going into a job. Let's suppose you don't learn anything this quarter in this course. You're not interested in computational thinking or programming or computing, uh, algorithm development and so on. That to, but there's someone else is going to do that because it's got to get done. Someone's got to write that accounting system. Someone's got to <coughs> install that accounting system. Someone has to write a script that does the backup of those accounting files with the data and the database connections. You may not be building the whole system, but you may find yourself or your organization where you work that there is some need to do some kind of programming, some kind of scripting. You know, it could not, doesn't have to be extensive programming. It could be something very small. And uh, it could be you. It could be you that solves those problems. Or it could be someone else in your organization. But if it's you, of course, obviously, you're more valuable to your to your employer. So it's, it's, a, it's a great um, asset for you to have as a, as a future worker in the workforce to know how to do the things that we're going to learn how to do in this class. Okay. So here are some specific learning objectives. I mean, basically, I, I went through the book and I, I looked at the topics covered in the book. So I'm not going to go through those in detail here, but that's if you're interested, you can look at those. Although this, these items here are not covered in the book. How to use integrated development environments is not mentioned. I don't think it's mentioned in the book. Uh, maybe it is. How to use a version control system is not covered in the book. Um, you're not going to be tested on this topic. But you have to know how to do it because you need, that's, how we can, that's how we submit our work. Uh, but th that hopefully that's not going to be stressful because you know, we're here to help you do that. All right, so here's some guidelines that I want everybody to you know, read through these. And maybe what I'll do is I'll come back later and talk about these in, uh, in more detail. These are, these are the criteria that I'm going to apply uh, to the work that you submit. Okay, so you're not going to submit, you're going to, yeah, <coughs> excuse me, you're going to submit writing assignments in this course. You're going to submit code. You're not going to submit English. You're going to submit C++ writing assignments. And I'm going to apply the, this, these criteria to the work that you submit. And let, we'll come back to this later and we'll talk about this because we, we want to get our hands dirty with some work first to just to, to better understand what I'm talking about here. Although, obviously, a lot of these things are, are pretty straightforward. There's a distribution of points. So there's four items or four products that, that y you produce that will be used to, to assess your learning in the course. And those are labs, assignments, and two exams. Computer Science and Engineering Club, you know, if that's something that, if you're, if you're a major, if you're a computer science major or computer engineering major or computer systems major or a bioinformatics major, those are all um, uh, majors that are very close together. You may want to uh, join the Computer Science and Engineering Club. If you're a non-major, it's also maybe of interest to you as well. It's a very active club. So they do a lot of fun things. And they also, it's a source of, of um, not only camaraderie, but also a source of uh, a support 
You know, there's, there's a lot of very knowledgeable upper class students that can help you install X or fix Y or get rid of a virus. That's a typical thing I see. They have an email, uh, what do you call it, email discussion going on. And, and, the, and, and it seems that one of the, 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 the most commonly discussed topics is how to remove a virus from your father's computer or something like that. So there's a lot of advice and information going on about that. Stuff that's not covered a lot of times in classes. So I do uh, encourage everybody to, to join that club. There's the syllabus. We'll probably have to come back to it later, especially to talk about these topics here. But you, you should go through that syllabus, read it, and, and, uh, and understand it. Coming back to, to the main web page, we've just gone through this item. Now let's, uh, let's talk about uh, Blackboard. And I will log in. Oops. Does it, anybody use Blackboard in here in other courses? Does this look different? Yeah, this is the new Blackboard. So we are guinea pigs. We're doing a pilot. We're part of the pilot study for the new Blackboard. So this is a newer, bigger, improved, more complex, harder to use version of Blackboard. So uh, in here, under tools, and I, I want to talk about this, uh, this online. Anybody else? get this downloaded yet? Anybody interested? You know, I, I love it when you bring your laptops and you work along with me. I mean, that's the kind of class this is. So, you know, if you have a laptop and you're wondering, is this the kind of class where I want to use or do this? Am I going to irritate the instructor if I'm tapping away? Well, no. Bring it, use it, and, uh, and that's great, especially in the lab. Okay, so we're going to, we'll provide, you don't actually need a computer to go through this class. You know, you don't need you can do everything from the lab, and the labs are set up for that. But I, I do think it's probably better for you if you use your own computer. And you can do a combination. You can use the machines in the lab, and then you can use your desktop and at home, and your laptop here, and maybe your cell phone, whatever. And uh, so that's, uh, that's what I think. There's Wimba Pronto. And these other links in here, I haven't really started using any of these. This is a, these are wikis. And um, I use a wiki for the course. Here it is. This is a wiki. But it's my wiki. I'm the only one that has an account. I'm the only one that can modify that wiki. But here, apparently, we can create instances of wikis and uh, for all of us to, to use. Uh, I don't know if that's going to be of use to us or not, but if anybody has an idea, uh, let me know and just get started. I don't know if you can, you need me to create a wiki for you or, or, or for everybody. I, I don't know. I've never used this. So who's ever interested in this, jump on it and also talk to me about it because I, I want to learn more about uh, what's available in this system and I, I don't really know it. So, um, all these things. Groups, I, I never use this. Journals, tasks, I, I don't know what, and discussion board. I used to use Google Groups and I was ready to use it this quarter and I thought, no, there's probably something built into the new Blackboard because the old Blackboard has a terrible discussion board. And uh, perhaps the new Blackboard has a better one. So I'm, I'm willing to give it a try. So I, I erased the link to Google Groups, which I normally use for, for discussion. So the, the style, the, the, what happens in Google Groups is someone can post a message, and that message gets broadcast to everybody in the group. Uh, so, and you, it's easy. Just in your email, you reply to that message, and that, that reply goes to everybody. And if you want to look at old messages, you just log into Google Groups, and you see an archive of all the old messages. It's very convenient. And pretty much you use it without ever going to Google Groups. You go there and you create an account, 
and that's it. You forget about it, and everything is done through your email system. That's very convenient. So I, I hope that uh, the Blackboard system is just as convenient, but uh, we'll wait. We'll see how that goes. Maybe your interface looks different than mine. I, I don't know. Probably it looks different, right? This lecture capture. I think that's what I'm doing right now. I'm actually capturing this lecture. And um, I think what I'll do is I'll... Okay. So now there's lab reports here. And as you can see, there's 10 lab reports. So you, you know, and when you finish the lab, you have to go here and submit a lab report. It's very simple. You go in there and there's two problems for lab one. And problem one is, did you finish problem one? And you say yes, or you say no. That's it. Okay, so I just want you to, you know, make a record. And then I, then I will grade your lab. And then the grade is automatically inserted into you know, the grade book and all that. It's very convenient for me. <coughs> uh, but I want to tell you about the labs, is the labs should be trivial. Right? The labs should, they're not designed to be challenging. The, lab, uh, the labs are designed, although the problems that you do in the labs are challenging, but it won't be challenging for you to do them, at least not too challenging, because, you know, we're going to walk you through the solution of the problems in lab, during lab. So it, you should be able to get, no matter what your skill level is, you should get 100% credit for every lab. But it's the assignments here. Those will be challenging. The assignments will be problems, programming problems that look like the lab problems. But this time, instead of us telling you what to type where, you know, not quite that far, but, you know, giving you lots of hints and guidance, instead of us uh, showing that to you, that uh, you'll be more on your own. I mean, you can still get support and, you know, and work together collaboratively and, and, and evolve us also in lab if there's time. Uh, so, but they are designed to be more challenging, right? So the, the procedures and concepts that you learn going through the lab exercises, hopefully you can develop a deeper understanding and mastery as you work out the assignments. And that's it. So, you know, on Blackboard, really, all we need to use is, um, is the lab reports and the assignment reports. There's nothing else to do there unless we want to uh, use the discussion board in there or the wiki. On also, this Wimba Pronto, I feel very... Um, uh, hopeful for this particular tool. John, can you think of anything you want to add to all that about using using the tools? You don't have to say anything. I mean, you know, but if you had something that you were wishing to say, just just blurt it out, okay? And at any time. Yeah. All right. Okay. We've we've been looking at other things too, like Skype, for instance, and desktop sharing, and so we're investigating all kinds of tricks that we could use this quarter and uh, so we'll see how it goes if by the way once again if anyone has a, a recommendation or suggestion you know please let me know you know i'm very interested in developing this these procedures that uh, that make uh, learning this particular material more interesting and more efficient all right for students in the future or for you getting you know as we go along through the course of course all right, so that's uh, that's a blackboard. I think we can uh, uh, do without that at this point. Now I have a link here to uh, notes, CS201 notes. Let's take a look at what's there. And this is just a place for me to post things that I think are relevant to our discussion and, uh, and what you're doing, okay? So I've already started uh, making notes here. And uh, there's a hello program, for instance. I, I posted that the other day. You might find that as you test, you know, your system, you could just copy this and paste it into a, an editor and build something. And there's, there's some notes on the Subversion command line. 
you can see they look fairly cryptic, right? So this is, uh, but that's not, a, that's not something to get stressed about. It's not something you're going to be evaluated on. But it's something that's highly worth learning. If you go into software development in particular, I know that half of you are not computer science majors, right? And half of you are. So for those half who are, um, it's almost certain that you'll use something like Subversion to work in groups. And for the other half who are not computer science majors, I think there's a good chance that you'll use something like the version as well. So I think it's very useful. So we're going to be covering that. Some notes on Linux. Now, the class, this course is platform independent. You can do the work on a Macintosh computer, on a Windows computer, or a Linux computer, or a BSD computer, or maybe there's some other things too. Maybe Android. No, you cannot do it on an Android because I don't think you can build C++ on an Android right now. I don't know that. I think not. That's a Java platform. Okay, so it's platform independent. Now, when you in the labs, the labs are have computers that run Linux. So if you use the lab computers to do the coursework in here, you'll have to learn a little bit about Linux. Not too much. You know, Linux in the old days was, was pretty tough to use, but Linux in the contemporary days looks a lot like your other graphical, graphically based operating systems such as OS X and, and Windows. So here's some notes if you happen to be uh, installing or using Linux at home or on a laptop. And here's some notes if you use, I think the most popular platform is Windows. So these are notes, which is what I'm using. And uh, so these are notes related to in setting up your Windows environment to do the problems in this course. We'll look at those. And here's some notes on uh, which I'll try to cover today, or if not today, maybe um, maybe on Wednesday, some, some general introductory notes that you know I developed over the break about uh, what a computer is and things like that. Yeah, and then I just there's some some uh, let's let's look at these. These are articles. Let's take a look at this one. I think I can get the sound for this. Oh. That's an advertisement, right? I just wait for that. This is neat. This is um, a video story about um, special effects. So I think that's pretty neat. That's pretty interesting. All of those things, all the water droplets and ripples, everything is uh, is computed, right? So these are these are simulations that are done with uh, with very powerful computers. And what kind of a computer do you think is doing creating those animations? Huh? How, what kind of hardware do you think they're employing to do that? It's just it's not just a bigger, faster, you know, Intel processor. It's an array of GPUs, of graphics processing units. It's like, you know, a hundred video cards put together in a single machine. Maybe not a hundred. Well, it could be a hundred. So that's a, 
that's a big event now in computing is using video technology and uh, using it to solve interesting problems, especially problems related to simulation. That's what we just looked at. We, we, we looked at simulation, a simulation of water. And, uh, and so that's, and the reason why they use GPUs or graphics processing units, you know, graphics cards, is because graphics cards, deep down in the hardware guts of them, they are, they run algorithms in a parallel manner. So you could have an algorithm and you're running, you know, uh, 500 instances of that algorithm. So all at the same time, 500 simultaneous calculations, identical calculations are taking place. And that's why you can do things like this in a reasonable amount of time. Let me just tie it in a little bit. What we just saw with, uh, with what we're doing here at Cal State. You know, we, we do some some work of this uh, of this sort. Let me see. I think I I saved uh, something. Where did I put that? It's not there. Um, where did I put that? Oh, it's online here. Uh, Chan Ho and I are working with some other students on a on a game engine development project that we call it Genj. And I just want to show you. Oh, here's a little animation that we created. Actually, Chan worked on this with another student. So this is the work of Chan Ho and David Stover using the the game engine that we've been building uh, to simulate um, a scene, a very short animation. I'll just take a minute to download that. And uh, David Stover, by the way, graduated and he got a job at DreamWorks. So he's working at DreamWorks right now as a programmer uh, doing cool things. So let's see, where did I put that? It must be in uh, there. There it is. Oops. <coughs> How do I play this? MP4. See, that's what you get. I, I just re reinstalled everything on my computer and I don't have um, what I need. Final media player. Hmm. Anybody have a recommendation? DLC. <laughs> Which one? DLC. VLC. VLC, that, and when, uh, VLC, wow, that's great. Thanks for that recommendation, right there. I just download it. That was, that was, um, Unanimous VLC, a unanimous vote on that. I install that with confidence. Okay, so this is what is this? I don't want to install any like things that plug into my browser. Except is all right on that. And custom, take these off. Got it. All right. There's a lot of accepting to do here. What's that? Decline that one, thank you. Actually, I, I should have declined something else, right? Declined on that one? Decline, decline. This is getting trickier to install these things. I never hit that many decline buttons before. <laughs> Okay, I think that's it, right? Let's take a look here. Um, back to there. Oh, it's not done? Okay. There it is.
right That's it. Oh my gosh. Up activate the uh, Huh? Uncheck that one, right? There it is. There's no audio. Actually, this, how do I pause that? This is, um, you know, you would never see a game engine do this. Can you actually see that? Is that okay? It's hard to see, right? Um, it's got, you know, it's too much visual information. So you couldn't run this in real-time mode. You could not run this. You, you wouldn't be able to see this in a game. See the reflections you can see through the balls or glass balls. Uh, the, the, the mirroring effect. You see the light passing through there. There's reflections and shadows and, and uh, what is it? Refraction or something? Whatever it is. There's an aw awful lot. What's that? Reflection and refraction. Reflection and refraction. And there's an awful lot of that going on. You can't do this. <coughs> you know in a a video game or a, a virtual world emulator, I guess, I don't know what you call it, that uh, you would want to produce 60 or at least uh, 30 frames per second. So could you compute each frame of animation here in 1 30th of a second? No, that's too much. There's too much going on here. So the physics isn't that bad. You can do the physics in real time. You can simulate the balls dropping and knocking the cubes over, but it's, uh, it's the reflection and the refraction calculations and the other lighting, perhaps other lighting calculations that takes so much uh, computing time. So this is done, you know, offline. So this is just an animation, right? So you have to, you might take an hour to compute one frame or 15 minutes to compute one frame, whatever. How long did it take you to on to, to create that. Do you remember? It's like a couple of hours to run. The lighting for each frame. Well, that's not bad. So it took, what, an hour or something? What, and you did it on one machine? Or did you use several machines? Five machines. So you did five separate machines to do this, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's the trend, right? You've got to use lots of processors to do things in parallel. That, that is the trend. That's the current, you know, hot area in computer science in, in terms of applications. <laughs> parallel processing. And uh, <coughs> anyway, David's gone on. He's at DreamWorks now. And, you know, he's doing this sort of work. He's, 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 he's coding and, and looking at algorithms and, and doing interesting things with animation. And this is a project that we're, we're doing right now. And uh, anyone here is also welcome to join in on that as you, uh, as you go through your program here. So what is this? I ran it twice, OK. All right, we got that installed. Let's see, I had another one. Oh, here's another interesting article. And maybe we'll talk about these as, we, as, we, uh, as I read them or as you read them. <coughs> Algorithms take control of Wall Street. Well, this is not really big news, right? I mean, this is old news. But uh, Wall Street, I mean, so much of what goes on on Wall Street is just automated reasoning and transaction processing, like trading, trading systems. How many people execute trades manually now? I mean, it's, it's done using you. You say, I'm a trader. I'm a, I trade commodity futures or something, right? What does that mean? It means you're, you're half programmer. 
half traitor. So you're devising, well, you know, if the weather in Argentina is above 32 degrees centigrade and, you know, stocks in the, in the German Deutsche Bank is, uh, you know, doing something, then, uh, then execute this trade or go short on that stock, you know, those kind of things, you know, that, I mean, not, not that, but that type of, um, those are called algorithms, right? It's a, it's a instructions on how to do something. So the trader doesn't even execute the trade. They just say, you know, type it in there. But it's used a lot for trading on, uh, you know, on the, on, the, on, the, on the level of a few seconds. So you could enter into a, a, a financial commitment, hold your position for 50 seconds, and then exit, you know. And you do that. That's what you do. That's your job is to figure out how to take advantage of of kind of microscopic movements in the financial markets with you know huge sums of money. My uh, my PhD advisor is uh, is at NYU, and uh, you know he lives in Manhattan and he works there. And uh, his PhD students, although they're studying computer science, they're all getting jobs in Wall Street. So there's been lots of hiring there, and they're very attractive jobs. I mean they might start a fresh PhD student off with $250,000 a year. That's, that's really attractive. But yeah, you know, it's hard to get to that point. It's hard to get to that point. But that is, uh, that is something that's going on in Wall Street. All right. <coughs> Let's get back to, uh, to business here. And uh, now this course is about, let me see if I go back one here. So we looked at these three links. This is the activities, lab assignment, lab assignment, lab assignment, midterm, and lab assignment down to final. So that's it, that's the rhythm of the course. And this is a weekly rhythm, uh, a weekly cycle, you know, interrupted with a midterm here. We'll take a look. So lab one, actually, the people in the first lab, you know, we're meeting, the people in the Monday lab anyway, we're meeting after class today. So this lecture ends at 12, at 1.15, and the lab session starts at 1.30. So in that lab session, we will uh, go through these instructions and wa walk you through the learning of these tools. And we will be in a Linux lab environment. So you'll start to use, if you haven't used a Linux operating system, you'll have some new, perhaps new exposure to that today. Uh, if you're familiar with it already, that's great. And uh, everything is explained here. I'll, I'll, we'll go into the, the details of this uh, in lab. But there's many ways to do the problems in this course. That's one of the things I want to keep coming back to and that you'll you know, see that obvious as we go along, you can do these problems in so many different ways, so many different <laughs> de development environments. Uh, Linux is one way, OS X is another, Windows is another, those are three. And even on Linux, I think I had in my notes here, three and a half different ways to do the problems in this class. And I explain them here. You can do the problems in the lab. That's it. Two, you can install Linux on a home or laptop computer and do the problems there. So these are the ways of doing the problems in this class on Linux. The third way, you can install Linux on a virtual machine on your OS 10 or Windows computer and do the labs there. Or number three and a half, and I say it's a half because it's not a complete solution. You can only do some, you, you, can, you can write all the programs using this way, but you can't run all of them. You can only run half of them. Because uh, here you log in to a computer that's in the lab, write the programs on that remote computer, compile them, and if the program doesn't use the the, a graphics window from the operating system, in that case you can run it. If it's a command line program, a console program, you can run the program remotely using a, 
this terminal window. But if it has, if it if the program requires a graphics window, then you won't be able to run it. That's why I call it three and a half. Lots of different ways. And uh, now let me go back to. I think I have enough time to finish everything. That was my general introduction. I want to talk now a little bit about the language and what you're going to be learning in terms of um, a language, a computer language. So the language is called C++. And it's, it's not an easy language. Right? It's known to be a difficult language. But it's a very important language. And it's widely used. And by going through the class, it's going to give you lots of insights, hopefully, Lots of insights into how software is built and ha how it runs. Most of you are not going to be C++ programmers. How many of you are going to end up being C++ programmers or using it in, a, in your employment? It, it's, you know, the chances are pretty small. But what you're more likely to, to have happen to you is that you will use a different language. But what you learn using this language in this course can carry over into those other language environments. So an, an, a conditional, an if statement, an if statement, an if else statement in C++ operates the same way in every other language. It, it's a little bit different, but it's essentially the same. It's a conditional. And how to, how to go from a problem statement to a solution, you know, devising an algorithm and implementing it in a particular language, that process and that concept and that skill hopefully is what you're going to pick up in this class. And I, I'll give you an example. No, wait a minute. I'll wait for the example. i wait until a few minutes here. Let's, I'm going to start, now I'm going to talk about what is a computer here. Let's start at the, the hardware level here. And I actually don't know a lot about this, not an area that I do a lot of work in, but you know, I went through my courses and I studied this um, in an academic setting. I never, I never used much of this uh, in, in, uh, in a real life setting, like in a job. You know, I worked as a programmer before. I've been a software developer. I've been a transportation planner. And I've been a, an insurance actuary. I've done a bunch of things. And, uh, and in all those jobs, all of those jobs, I've always uh, written code. I've always developed programs. So, but let's go deeply here. We're not building a computer, but if we were to build a computer or look at it, what is it that we see, okay? Well, the first thing to keep in mind is that, uh, that you can divide uh, what you're looking at there into two areas of concern. One is memory, and the other is called the central processing unit, right, the insides of a computer. And the, the memory is used to store instructions, machine instructions, and also data. And the central processing unit is the thing that reads and executes the instructions and accesses and modifies the data. Uh, the fact that memory contains both things, machine instructions and data together, that's the way computers are designed. You know, RAM. You know, when you get four gigabytes of RAM. You know, that RAM holds machine instructions and data mixed together. That's how computers work. But that was not obvious in the past. You know, when computers are first being invented, the people didn't know. They thought, well, we'll put the machine instructions here, we're going to put the data there. And it still could be done like that, of course. But it's not how things developed. It turns out that the way computers are built now is machine instructions and data are mixed together in the same memory. And that's called the von Neumann architecture. So it's that important. It's given a name. And uh, <coughs> so these machine instructions, these collections of machine instructions that a central processing unit executes is... Um, 
is what a program is. A computer program is a collection of machine instructions with some data that is bloated into memory or RAM. When I say memory, I mean RAM. I don't mean hard disk memory, which is another form of memory. So I could mean that if I said memory. But right now, memory in this context means RAM. Okay, it's called it's volatile memory. If you turn the computer off, all the information that's in RAM is lost. But all the information that's on the hard drive is not lost. Right, that's persistent memory as opposed to volatile memory. Now, volatile memory is useful because it's fast. Right? I mean, if, if, the, if, if the memory, if accessing, if reading and writing memory to the disk drive were as fast as RAM, then why have RAM? Might as well just get the persistence for free. But it's not the case. You know, reading and writing into the disk drive is very slow. Uh, so when we run a program, what we do is we copy the machine instructions and the data that goes with them. We copy that into RAM, into volatile memory that requires for the computer to be turned on. And then we execute the program in that context. And but it turns out, you know, reading and writing instructions to RAM is also slower than it has to be. We can, we, we need something even faster, or we can have something even faster. We have what's called registers. So registers, there's a small number of registers in the CPU that data and instructions taken from RAM are placed into the registers and that that's where the instructions are actually executed by the CPU. And they have this thing called caches, these caches, you know, the L1 cache, the L2 cache, I don't know if you're familiar with those terms. That's intermediate volatile memory between RAM and the registers. It's faster than the RAM, but slower than the registers but cheaper than the registers and, and, and smaller, so you can pack a lot in there onto your chip. And so you've got data that's going from the disk drive into RAM into a sequence of caches that are, you know, progressively more, or se progress sequentially more, uh, uh, faster and more expensive and smaller until you hit the registers. The registers, that's, that's where the buck stops the registers are where the, the instructions are actually executed, where the data is actually manipulated, or some operation of the data is performed in registers. So this is computer hardware. This is the topic called computer architecture or computer organization. It's not something, it's something I'm just talking about very briefly in the, on day one, and that we're not going to talk about later, except a little bit when we talk about addressing memory, because when you work in C++, you have to think about memory and how you access memory in the computer. So it's kind of a low-level-ish language, C++. You're, a lot of programmers like to work in C++ because it feels close to the, to the machine, right? It's a, it, C++ was evolved out of C, and C is very, was, was, was evolved out of assembly language, which is essentially machine instructions. So a, a program is a collection of machine instructions that's loaded into memory and executed by the CPU. That's, that's described here. And the, the, a running instance of a program is called a process. So kill the process. You got an alt, control, delete, you know, task manager, kill. That's a process. It's a memory. The program is something that's on your disk drive. It's an executable. When you take that executable, load it into RAM, it becomes a process. In fact, you could take a single executable and load it multiple times into RAM. That means you have several instances of that program running simultaneously. So there's, and those instances are referred to as processes. And lots of detail, obvious stuff here. I think you can read about it. You know, operating system, things like that. You know, operating system is another program. Maybe I'll talk about this later. 
So that's um, that's a bit about what a computer is and what is computer memory. And here is one long lecture. You know, I could go on there for a long time, and uh, maybe we'll cover this later. But essentially, let me see if I can get the uh, essence. Let's extract the essence out of this. That uh, that at computer memory is um, is essentially a sequence of bits and a bit is something that has one of two states it's either on or it's off that's it computer memory is a sequence of on off switches and we say on well let's call that one and off let's call that zero okay so on off and well we group things together let's see okay let's look at so you can so you can look at the information. I mean, essentially, in the hardware, the data that's in the computer is is binary. Okay, it's in the form of binary numbers, numbers that are uh, represented with zeros and ones. So one bit you can't represent very much with one bit. It's either a zero or a one. And sometimes you need just a zero or a one when you're doing something. So in that case, one bit is sufficient. But generally. It's not sufficient, we need more. We need several bits taken together. So if you put several bits taken together, then instead of having two possible states, you have two to the n possible states. So if you have n bits, n bits in a sequence, the first bit is zero or one, the second bit is zero or one, the third bit, so that means you can have zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. Oh, says so with two bits, I got four possibilities. Now with three bits, I can go zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, one. So I, then I get eight possibilities. So in general, if you have n sequential bits, you have two to the n possible states for that 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 collection of bits. And uh, so a byte, a byte is uh, is a term that's very common. A byte is simply eight bits. And 8 bits has 2 to the 8th possible states, or 256 possible states, 0 through 255. That is a byte. One byte only has 256 possible states. Now, these numbers in the computer are used to represent two things. They're used to represent computer instructions, machine instructions, tell the machine what to do, and they're used to represent data. So, you know, if you have one bit, well, that's sufficient to, say, represent the fact whether, is it raining outside or is it not raining outside? Well, yes, it is. No, it's not. Oh, that's one bit is sufficient. But to represent, say, a character, let's try to represent the letter W. You know, one bit is not good enough. But is 8 bits good enough? A byte? To represent all the letters? Well, yeah. I mean, there's 26 letters. Well, the, oh, you have a number's uppercase or lowercase. Well, that's uh, 54 letters. No, 52 letters. And then we've got to throw in the punctuation. Yeah, it's another 40 or 30 or I don't know. It depends what punctuation you want to include. And well, yeah, we could pack it into two, two, 256. So, so we can represent character sets using bytes. Well, wait a minute. We can uh, represent languages that have fewer than 256 symbols in their, you know, as atomic elements in their language. So take a language like Chinese. One byte isn't good enough. There's way more. There's like 10,000 Chinese characters. And those, those are the primitive elements of their alphabet. There's, you know, those characters are not comprised of other sub -things. Well, they are in a sense. There are, you know, when you look at Chinese, there's actually patterns and, and that, that, so you could break Chinese characters into pieces, but it's all kind of, I'm not sure how precise it is. Uh, so there's a problem, you know, computers are first. It's interesting, actually. The computers were first built. You know, they were built in the United States and in England, in Europe, where the languages only have s a small number of of letters in their alphabets, and so one byte was good enough. 
but now that everybody uses machines, it, it's, it's, it's a global phenomenon, there's a problem representing languages that, uh, that have alphabets that uh, are large, like Korean, for instance, and uh, Chinese. What are other large alphabets that don't fit? Anybody know? I know Korean and, and Chinese are in there. Huh? Hindi, yeah, maybe, yeah, Hindi probably, just how many, are there like an, an alphabet of so many Hindi letters? I think Hindi can, is okay, well, I don't know, actually, I don't know. Well, at least there's Chinese, and Chinese is big enough now to, you know, force everybody over to, now we need more than one byte to represent character sets. So there's a, it's kind of like the, the, um, the Y2K problem. Eventually it was going to be, the time bomb was going to go off, we're going to have a problem. And, uh, and that is in fact the case. And now you'll see it internally when you look at systems, you see that some systems simply cannot support um, Chinese and Korean and other languages because of this, the fact that they chose a single byte representation for character sets. So it's a problem, big problem. And it employs a lot of people. So, you know, the more complicated this stuff becomes, the more work there is to do. And the more complicated it becomes, the more money you can make as well. I want to say that also. Uh, so anyway, this, I'm going to drop like a 15 minutes left. Let's see if I can wrap this up quickly here. That's memory. And then the CPU, that's uh, no diagrams to look at there. And then there's this thing called assembly language. And I wanted to talk about that. And I got this ready. We could actually type this in and run it. This is a, a program that prints hello in assembly language. You know, the first thing that people do when they learn a new language, a computer language, or maybe a, a regular language, how do I say hello? Right, so when you write your first program, you're going to say, how do I say hello? Actually, every project that I do, I always start with a hello program. It's like, oh, I've got to write some code in C Sharp. I'm going to do it with a web service. I'm going to do this and this and this. Okay, let's have the web service say hello. The client is going to say, print hello somewhere. And it's always a hello program as the first step. Because, you know, uh, writing code and solving algorithmic problems, solving problems that require a computer, um, usually are done incrementally. So you, you, don't, you, don't, you get a problem, you don't just solve it. You say, well, there are steps to getting there. First thing I'm gonna do, okay, you want me to write a program that's gonna balance your books. Uh, well, first, let's see, let me write a program that says hi first. Okay, now I'm gonna write a program that adds you know, a debit and a credit and then prints the result. Now I'm gonna write a, pr and then you're going, you converge through iterative development, you converge to the ultimate solution. And it really does always start with a hello program. Very interesting. Anyway, here is a hello program in assembly language. This, this is a lo called a low-level language, which is very close to machine instructions. Uh, these, this is language is very close to the, the, the form, the, 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 the instructions that the CPU executes, that it reads from RAM. And it's tough. I mean, I've got comments written here, All right? So this is this is a move command. So move. Uh, this is the number four. This is the, so uh, dollar sign four means just the number four. Move the number four into the EAX register. Move the number one into the EBX register, and there might be a dozen registers. Okay, and they're given different names. And then move, move the, the bytes that represent H-E-L-L-O into, uh, move the address. Move the address, uh, first of all, it tells the assembler, the program that analyzes this code, it says, uh, okay, here, when you get here, you've got to allocate um, uh, five bytes and you've got to store the code for H in the first byte, the code for E in the second byte. And uh, after you do that, then take the address of the first character of that sequence of bytes. Take what's the address of the first byte 
and store the address in the register ECX. So these are, this is, what's the goal of this program? The goal of the program is when I, when I, print, when I run the program, it says, hello. That's a pretty complicated way to say hello, right? I mean, we're telling the computer, the, 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 we want to make this one step closer to the machine. We would replace, and we could do that fairly easily, we would replace this, you know, with a four-byte machine instruction. So it's just some number that fits into four bytes. You know, we could type it out and, you know, we could enter it into RAM and then that's, that's that machine instruction. So this is very close to the hardware. <coughs> now, as people were walking into class today, I installed a new program. I installed a, a Python. I installed a, uh, a, uh, an interpreter or a development environment for a language called Python. And let's see if that works. Let's see if I installed it correctly. Because I want to write, just like this, this program says hello in assembly language. We could, we're running out of time. Maybe next week we'll, we'll type it in there and, or paste it in there and, and build it. Let's see if we can say hello in the Python language. All right? Let's see if we can do that. Uh, anybody in here use Python? Yeah. Okay, you can help here, okay? Because I... I'm new to the language. So you just watch what I'm doing. Tell me if I'm doing something wrong. I'm going to get a command console like this. And is that right? Okay, I want to do it in immediate mode. Oh, no, maybe I won't do it in immediate mode. Let me do... Let's create a... a um, this is a GUI. A Python shell, right? So... I can do print hello. Well, that, this is called immediate mode, right? So I, I type in the command and I run it. So I, I typed in the command. I said print hello and it prints hello. Now we could store that one line, print hello, in a file and then run that file. Let's see if we can do that. Let's try that. Let's... Um, Let's create a file. Hello.py. And let's uh, let's open with um, with WordPad, just a, or Notepad. And it's uh, print hello. Let's see if we can run that. This, is that sufficient to print hello? You don't know? You don't know how to write a hello program? I'm just kidding. No, I don't know. I'm a professor of computer science. I don't know if that's sufficient. Is that sufficient, Sean? Do I need a header or something like that? No. This is good, right? Okay. Let's, uh, let's bring up the command prompt here. And, uh, you know, DIR, this is the, the, the console window, right? This is the the text-based interface with what? The operating system. I'm talking to the operating system. That's what a console window is. So DIR, print the contents of the desktop. There it is, hello.py. Will Python run? Do I, do I run this? I don't know if it's in the, uh, in the path yet. Let's see if it's, uh, if it's there. Python is not recognized. Well, that means it's not in the um, it's not in the uh, the system path. So we'll just have to type in the whole. Um, whoop! What was that? Python 27. There it is, right there, right? All we have to do is type that in there. So there it is, and it's hello. There it is. We ran the program. Okay, we we ran we told we ran the the Python interpreter called Python, right? So I found it here, by the way. There it is, Python.exe. It's in this location. That's where it got installed when everyone was walking in. 
And, uh, and so I, I executed what's called the interpreter. The interpreter reads the contents of the file. Let's look at the contents of the file. There's the contents of the file. Wow, that's a lot nicer. I can, we can run that, or we, could, or we could do it in assembly language. Obviously, people, more people are using Python and assembly language to write hello, or to do a whole lot of other things. Uh, of course, there's, there's places where Python doesn't work. You have to have assembly language, but that's not this case. Now, my point is this. There's a continuum of complexity and difficulty in languages. Assembly language is at one end of the continuum, and Python is on the other. And we're almost done. Don't get too restless. And C++ is the language that we are working in. This is hello in the language that you're going to use this quarter. It's easier than assembly language, but it's not as nice as Python, is it? Huh? So, I mean, this was optional, actually. I could have omitted this line. It just doesn't work well in IDEs. So it could just be this one line right there. But what is this? What is this? What's this? We'll talk about this next time. But just to show you where we sit in this continuum of languages and their difficulty, we're sort of in the middle. And what you're going to learn here in this class are going to carry over. Uh, you'll be able to use it in other languages. So the class is general in that sense. And I'll see the people in lab that are going to lab today, and I'll see everyone else next Wednesday.